Venue Sports has been blocked from launching, and now there are questions about whether it will ever get off the ground. We're also taking a look into the fantasy football industry, and a pop star sports agency is facing legal action. It's Monday, August 19th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we're going to hear why the temporary injunction on venue sports could have huge long-term consequences for the streaming service from front office sports contributor Daniel Kaplan. We'll also get a look into the fantasy football industry from fantasy footballers host Andy Holloway. We'll also hear about some potential upgrades at U.S. Open home Arthur Ashe Stadium and an NFL team cutting a player without exactly knowing why. First, here are today's top headlines. A federal judge has granted Fubo TV's temporary injunction to block the inception of venue sports, which was scheduled to launch on Friday. Venue, a joint platform live sports streaming service that includes Warner Bros. Discovery, ESPN, and Fox Properties, was determined to violate antitrust laws that could cause Fubo TV customers to, quote, face irreparable harm in the absence of an injunction. Fubo alleges that it has tried to create a one-platform streaming service for all of these sports, but that they are forced to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to license and broadcast content that its customers do not want or need. More on this later. USMNT legend Landon Donovan is coming to the NWSL. The joint leading scorer in team history will serve as the interim head coach for the San Diego Wave for the remainder of the season. Wave team manager Camille Ashton said of the hire, We are thrilled to have Landon join the club and lead the team. His passion for this city and growing the game, along with having a player-first mentality, make him a natural fit for this club. A John Madden biopic is coming to the big screen, and director David O. Russell has found his man, Nicolas Cage. Russell called Cage one of our greatest and most original actors and said he would portray the best of the American spirit of originality, fun, and determination in which anything is possible, as beloved national legend John Madden. The film is backed by Amazon and the release date has not been announced. Bad Bunny Sports Representation Agency is headed to arbitration with the MLBPA. The hip-hop artist sports agency Remus Sports, which represents many Latino MLB players, was effectively banned by the MLBPA for providing unauthorized benefits and recruiting practices to acquire new players, including offering Bad Bunny concert tickets. In light of last week's decision to move to arbitration, Remus said they respectfully disagree, alleging that the Major League Baseball Players Association's actions violate the National Labor Relations Act and require additional legal scrutiny. Nickelodeon is getting its sixth NFL game ever this season. Historically, the Kids Channel has aired both Christmas and Super Bowl broadcast alternatives defined by slime-tastic on-screen elements, notable TV show characters, and the commentary of Nate Burleson and Noah Eagle. This year, one of the CBS wildcard games in January will be aired on Nick. The success has only grown over the years with the Super Bowl broadcast between the 49ers and Chiefs averaging 1.2 million viewers. Venue Sports was set to launch on Friday, just in time for the NFL season. Now that's not happening, and as my next guest Daniel Kaplan explains, the streaming service owned equally by Fox, Warner Bros. Discovery, and Disney is now facing a very uncertain future. That conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by freelance sports business writer Daniel Kaplan. Welcome, Dan. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to have you back on. So a judge has blocked venue sports from launching. They are due to, to launch on this Friday. This is, of course, the tie-up between Fox, Disney, and Warner Bros. Discovery. What does this mean for venues' fate in the near term? Uh, well, it definitely means it won't launch. Uh, it's not going to launch in time for the NFL football season. And, prop, and if you ask me, I don't think it will launch at all. Uh, I, I'm fairly confident that Disney, when, when, when it gets closer to the launch of its own direct-to-consumer uh, network. That's the streaming ESPN uh, plan they have for next year. Uh, they're they're going to turn their priorities to that. We had a source in the story uh, that we ran yesterday in, in front office sports who said that Disney is weighing its options. That's not good news for venue. Uh, remember, the, the preliminary injunctions, these aren't handed out like candy by courts. They're very difficult to obtain. And one of the requirements is that the judge has to make a decision that the, the plaintiffs have a good chance of winning at trial. So not only are we talking about a, that the, the venue is blocked temporarily, but the judge is indicating she thinks they may be blocked permanently. And yeah, let's get a little bit into the, the legal logistics here. So yeah, um, venue's been Fubo sued to block venue uh, on antitrust concerns. Uh, yes. A judge uh, gave a preliminary injunction, which means, yeah, it's not... They're not legally blocked forever necessarily, but they're saying, uh, the judge is saying, um, 
if venue were allowed to launch, um, Fubo would be harmed legally, you know, in a legally backable way. And therefore, um, you know, they're, they're blocked kind of before going to trial, um, is, and so is the trial going to happen now? Like, you know, what's, what's the, the status of, is, is that up in the air or are they definitely going to trial? The three uh, investors behind Venue, Warner Brothers, Discovery, Fox, and Disney will surely, they've said they'll appeal this decision. So that will wind its way through uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Presuming the judge's decision does not get overturned, it, it heads towards trial. Uh, now, there's been no trial date set. These, these kinds of cases can take years to get to trial. So we're, we're, we're talking, you know, late 2025, 2026, if you had a, if I had a guess. So it's not, it's not something like this is going to be resolved overnight. This, 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 I, I see this as a death blow to venue. Uh, I, I, I really do. As long as this injunction holds for the course of the trial, um, then, you know, by the time venue could theoretically launch, yeah, Disney will have launched an ESPN standalone streaming service and might not want to compete with itself. And, you know, obviously they have the Disney bundle and other ESPN plus and other ways uh, to reach customers through streaming. This is becoming a big headache for Disney. Uh, they, they don't really, you know, their, their CEO was deposed as part of the run up to the preliminary injunction hearing. This was, I mean, I, I was in the courtroom for the whole four and a half days of the preliminary injunction hearing for those listeners who are not familiar with it. It's akin to a mini trial just with, uh, lesser rules of evidence. And there were, I think it was 18 or 19 witnesses that testified in person in the court, including Tony Petiti, the Big Ten commissioner, and uh, Jimmy Pitaro, the president of ESPN. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, the case came down to this. Fox, you have to think of it as two different markets. There's the upstream market where Fox, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Disney, ESPN reside. And they, they are the programmers, they create the content, they create Sports Center and the, and the sports games, and they produce all of that. And then they distribute it to the downstream market. This is antitrust lingo. Um, they distribute it to the downstream market, and that's where the cable distributors are, uh, like the Spectrum, uh, Bios, uh, uh, Charter. And Fubo is a digital cable distributor, for lack of a better phrase. And they're saying, well, when we go to buy channels from ESPN, when we go to buy channels from Warner Brothers Discovery, when we go to buy channels from Fox, they require, if we want the sports channels, that we have to buy other things. If you buy, if you want ESPN on Fubo, the ESPN tells Fubo, you have to buy Disney Kids. You have to buy, you know, all these other channels that Fubo says nobody wants to watch or very few people want to watch. And so they are unable to create a bundle of just sports channels. That's what something Fubo has said they've wanted to do. And lo and behold, these three programmers come down into their own, come down into the downstream market and create this, this app that has just sports channels and no, no nothing else. So Fubo is saying, you, you're, you're going to put us out of business because all our subscribers who are here for sports are going to go there. Now, there's a lot of arguments against that, but the, the judge was convinced that uh, it, it, was, it was sound enough that there, there's potential antitrust violation. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I can sort of see both sides of this case right now, you know, not being an antitrust lawyer myself. Um, but, you know, it sounds like the, the venue side is, you know, they're going to appeal. They've got a case here. And from there, I mean, assuming that Fubo and, you know, is able to keep its team together here, it feels like this could ultimately end up in the Supreme Court because if, once you're at the Circuit Court of Appeals, one way or another, someone's going to appeal. Obviously, the Supreme Court wouldn't have to take the case, but... Um, does that feel like one potential destination here to you? It, it, it ultimately could. I mean, you're, now you're talking a time frame of four or five years probably before it would get to the Supreme Court. And I'm not convinced that the venue partners will stick together. Um, that, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, we had a source tell us that ESPN was weighing its options. I mean, that's, that's, out, that's minutes after the decision came down that they're weighing their options. So... There's no indication they're about to pull out of the venue project, but if this drags on and they launch what they're calling flagship, the you know ESPN streaming, uh, and that's a big success, 
you know, why do they need this headache? Yeah, and on the WBD side, um, when Venue was launched, it looked like they were going to keep NBA rights. So they're, you know, they still have sports, of course, but um, they lost kind of their biggest thing. Um, so yeah, if, if if Disney pulls out, like, does Fox really want to, you know, team up with just WBD without the NBA, assuming you know, they're not able to keep the NBA through their own legal challenges? Yeah, it's, in, I mean, Disney has the option of flagship. But Fox, which does not have a, a vibrant streaming uh, option, they, they 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 don't have any way to digitally distribute their sports programming, uh, their 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 traditional cable bundle. So uh, ESPN won't have that problem come next year. It'll be interesting to see if Fox tries to create its own sports streaming service. If indeed venue falls apart, they're going to appeal. What yes. is the, the, the time frame for when they, they might learn if, if they can overturn this injunction and launch even while going to trial? Well, I, I don't know the legal in, ins and outs and if they can file an emergency appeal saying this is, you know, our, our business is in, is in danger here. Please, you know, judges of the Second Circuit, take our, our appeal up quickly. But traditionally, this, this is a long process. This is not overnight. This can be six months, nine months, a year, and they're, they're, the, the court has to accept the case. The court then sets a briefing schedule. Uh, the court then sets oral arguments, and then it's anyone's guess after oral arguments when a decision comes down, and that, 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 takes, that takes a long time. All right. Very interesting. Dan Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It was a pleasure. The Bucks have cut linebacker Randy Gregory for a training camp no-show, but the team has no idea why he wasn't there. Tampa Bay's head coach Todd Bowles was asked about the situation on Sunday and kept it blunt, telling ESPN, I'll never find out why Gregory never showed, but I wish him the best and we'll move on from there. Can't miss what you never had. Gregory has a lawsuit against the NFL and the Broncos over a $500,000 fine he received for using the drug Dronabinol, which he says he was prescribed for anxiety. Now he will continue this lawsuit as a free agent, at least for the time being. Arthur Ashe Stadium, the world-famous site of the U.S. Open, may be getting some upgrades in the next few years. The USDA has proposed a curved entrance gate and expanded promenade, including a panorama deck on the second level. According to the proposal, the renovation focuses on redefining the south entry by creating an iconic gateway. The potential timeline for the project runs from this year to 2027. The tournament begins today. Fantasy football has long been an outlet for big NFL fans and something that deepens interest in the game. In recent years, it has also become a bridge to sports betting. I spoke to longtime fantasy analyst and podcaster Andy Holloway about how that industry has evolved with the NFL's growing prominence in American media and culture. I'm joined now by Andy Holloway, co-host of the Fantasy Footballers podcast. Welcome, Andy. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So I want to talk about the fantasy industry generally. I mean, the NFL is probably the most popular thing in America, you know, maybe with the exception of Taylor Swift, (laughs) one or two other entities. But I'm wondering how you've seen the fantasy world grow or evolve through the NFL's growth. And it's if it's been a steadier ride or, you know, if it's been more the rocket ship of the NFL. Yeah, I mean, the NFL is so powerful. And it's funny because Taylor Swift and the NFL came to that juxtaposition together last year. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think I think we've seen quite a bit of uh, evolution through the technology maturing. And, you know, in the fantasy space with the NFL, you know, everybody has their team in their pocket on their phone and uh, the ability to stay up to date and always have something to check while the NFL has been um, spending so much time on new media, streaming services, all of that stuff. Uh, you've just seen this maturation of the most dominant force in media over the last 10 years that that has just been, you know, for us, it's in conjunction with podcasting growing at the same time. And, um, you know, it just seems like the NFL, even when COVID hit, nothing was going to stop the NFL from getting their games played, uh, from expanding to international um, markets and, you know, we, we just kind of sit back and, and ride the wave with the NFL. And as that fandom grows, even internationally, are you seeing, you know, just more people coming into the fantasy world and um, more people trying to get up to speed? Or is it, I'm just wondering if it's fantasy is kind of more for like the second or third level fan who's, you know, 
um yeah. well, it goes to that, that level yeah no i think i think it was at one point in time definitely reserved for the nitty-gritty stat nerd type of category but i think as gaming in general has evolved so like the regulated sports betting world um is introducing some more simplistic gaming for people to participate in which is really what i mean fantasy to me and to the show that we do is all about like elevating your enjoyment of the sport um we we play it so we have a camaraderie with our friends so that we can enjoy what's going on in a really otherwise boring game or matchup you know all of a sudden it's exciting because you have players you're rooting for it's not just your home team and so this whole and i think that's what that's what we've seen with with gaming is that you can play a simple version you know people used to play and do play you know uh pools around the office right where you're picking different teams to win so anything that kind of uh engages um i think fans to you know watch that game they wouldn't have watched is kind of uh what elevates the sport so i think fantasy's had a big role in the nfl's popularity because every game is a must watch event all of a sudden so uh and then you know to have the expansion of like amazon streaming games and you know they've done a lot with technology in terms of advancing the way we watch football um you know i i think you can be a little bit more casual and really enjoy the gaming aspects now whereas before you probably had to be knee deep in a spreadsheet and is the nfl con- supporting this world in in some tangible way or are they mostly just kind of happy to have you along for the ride yeah i think that that has evolved over time as well i mean we've had a lot of players on the show and and we kind of at times feel sympathetic to the players that might not like the fantasy world because, you know, while they're out there trying to do something specifically for their team, you know, they might be getting, um, you know, what are social media criticism or or play, fans from the you know sidelines upset that they didn't do an individual stat or performance. But I think over time, there's been an appreciation for the kind of enthusiasm that comes with fantasy as a whole, and I think the NFL has has worked to recognize the impact that it that it makes and take the good aspects of of playing fantasy sports or or whether it's you know regulated sports betting and kind of integrate those more into the to the game um you know for us it's not about winning money at the end of the year it's about like enjoying the ride through the season and and that's kind of how we approach it so i think the nfl has embraced that side of it for sure um, it was fantasy often, you know, you put down a hundred bucks sure. for the year and it kind of keeps you engaged a little bit more. It gives you a little bit more than bragging rights, whereas obviously sports betting, it's, it's, you know, over the course of the year, a lot of people are, are wagering a whole lot more than that, yeah. uh, which is why the industry is as big as it is. How much overlap are you seeing between like, are people asking you for picks? Have you, has your job or your role kind of uh, shifted as sports betting has become legal in a bigger part of the industry? Yeah. I mean, we've, we've definitely, um, we, we stay focused on the redraft side in, in our show, but it's, you know, it's that information is still relevant to the sports better, right? Like if we're out here, you know, we pay attention to the books, right? The, the smartest minds in Vegas are setting game lines for, uh, you know, over unders in, in passing yardage or receptions. Like those are, lines that are relevant to us is we project how the week's going to go and give advice for fantasy players. But inversely, anything we talk about from a game scheme standpoint or strategy, those things are impactful on people that want to go place wagers or bets. So there is crossover uh, between the two naturally. Um, But, you know, we kind of stay focused on the redraft side and, and um, you know, if there's a, you know, DFS is another bridge between the two, which is a, you know, it's not just straight sports betting, but it's more about building rosters based on information like you do in fantasy. So um, we kind of see the lines blur between them at times. Right. I mean, DraftKings and FanDuel started as DFS companies, obviously yes. with an eye toward yes. legalized sports betting. But I mean, that's mm-hmm. even why they have the names that they do is uh, no they were yeah, anticipating that. that. Um, and is DFS still, I, I imagine a lot of that was kind of eaten up by sports betting, but is DFS still alive and well? Yeah, it's still got a it's still got its loyal fans and and it's a different type of game, you know, and uh I actually really enjoy it. Like we we didn't have regulated sports betting at all in Arizona for a long time uh or DFS, so we couldn't participate in those for many years of doing this show. And when they added, you know, when when Arizona legalized it and regulated it, I assumed I would enjoy doing things like placing um you know, prop bets and stuff. And I actually really enjoyed the DFS play more than anything else. It was, 
it was building a roster. It was it was more about like seeing um, how a certain game trajectory was going to go. And so I ended up kind of enjoying doing that casually more than I did the sports betting. In the fantasy industry itself, have you seen uh, analysts, you know, whether I guess it, obviously it could be not necessarily fantasy, but are, are people from that world getting hired up by teams that are looking for an edge on their the analytical side? I think that that has happened. I mean, you, you've definitely seen um, some of the major players in that in that space trying to acquire talent and to, you know, bring more of that. Um, you know, it's just a competitive space, right? It's a competitive market. Uh, everybody wants an edge, and um, so there's there's a lot of companies, you know, building unique tools and resources for those type of things for sure. Yeah, and have you found that the, you know, your I'm not quite sure, not necessarily your like entry level player, but you're, you know, someone who's maybe just like in their second, third year of fantasy, like the level's getting higher. Have you found over the years as, you know, more tools come in and, you know, as, as fantasy yeah. itself gets more popular. Yeah. Have you found that like, you can't just crush your league if you kind of uh, are the one with the spreadsheets? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that there's a wide variety of kind of skill levels and types of leagues. And that's something we've noticed has stayed consistent throughout the 10 years is that there's just there's a lot of family leagues there's a lot of work leagues there's a lot of casual leagues and um because the platforms have become more sophisticated they can support a, you know dynasty leagues and big rosters and and different rule sets like that has allowed people to kind of dig in deeper if they want to but at the same time like um there there have also been platforms that come along and make things really easy to get a new league started and to um, you know, for, for us is really like a holistic look at the whole big picture where it's like, this is a way that like my whole family can enjoy Sunday even more. You know, my kids, uh, are old enough to, you know, one of them co-manages the team with me and that's just like a fun bonding connection point. So, um, I, I do think that there's the ability to dive super deep now because of the technology, but there's still a lot of casual, you know, I'm probably only checking my roster once a week and, you know, those type of leagues as well. Before we let you go, obviously this isn't like a picks kind of show, but I'm curious if you've got. I'm going to ask you for a two teams, two players, uh, <laughs> one overrated or overrated, one underrated. Uh, so let's start with um, overrated player. Seems a little mean, I guess, but I guess that's the industry. Yeah, I mean, it, sure. Yeah, there, there's uh, generally there's this pendulum swing that happens in fantasy. So if a player has a really big performance the year before. Um, they get overdrafted. Yeah. So I think that the one team that's kind of, everyone's kind of like excited for, but, but maybe should be scared about in fantasy is just like CJ Stroud and the Texans. Cause he's the new face of the league, but he's being drafted really high because of that. And everyone's excited to have him on their team. And that's just a really high bar. Like if you get drafted really, really high, you got to perform or it's a disappointment. So that would be one that I think it will be really challenging for him to be as consistent as where he's being drafted underrated uh who you're kind of like sleepers or uh you know yeah. for uh, give me a player in the team yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be like super biased here in arizona which is i think the arizona cardinals offense in particular is being very underrated for fantasy kyler murray um dealt with the injury missed half a season whenever you miss games people you know that stepped away from football they come back they look at the numbers from last year and they go oh he didn't perform that well well he's pretty good over the back half of the year once he got back from injury and he's being drafted much lower than the guys like cj stroud or joe burrow so he's kind of that value pick and the arizona offense was actually really good over the back half of the year now they added marvin harrison in the draft which is a huge uh, offensive weapon so I think Arizona, because of where they fall in the NFC West and probably not near the top of that division, are probably going to get overlooked and could prove very helpful for fantasy players. All right. Well, I'm sure you just made a few of our listeners' days. Andy <laughs> Holloway, thanks so much for joining us on the show. No problem. Tom Brady sat down with Stephen A. Smith at Fanatics Fest on Friday and had a lot to say on his future in TV and the people who he is inspired by. Brady listed a few big media names, including Chris Collinsworth and Troy Aikman, but notably did not mention Greg Olson who Brady will be taking over for next season. Despite losing his top spot on the broadcast, Olsen told FOS in May that he and Brady had spoken about the role and that Olsen said he wanted to be a great teammate, a great resource at whatever level I can be, but that he looked forward to competing against him throughout the season as well. The Olympics continue to create professional opportunities for athletes, and the latest benefit is French basketball player Gershon Yabuselli. 
The power forward was a first-round pick by the Boston Celtics in the 2016 draft, but only played 74 total NBA games in his career before going back overseas. Yabusele impressed on the Olympic stage, averaging 14.4 points per game, second on the French team that challenged Team USA for a gold medal. That led to many fans questioning why he flamed out in the association. Seems as though front offices have had the same thought, as it was announced that the Philadelphia 76ers would be signing him to a one-year, $2.1 million deal. Before we go, here's Jose Canseco getting emotional in his induction speech to the Oakland A's Hall of Fame. Another thing is, love to thank the fans. Like I said, I'm, I'm an emotional wreck right now. Can't believe this is being, I've been given this chance, the opportunity and the honor to have this jacket put on me. Again, thank you fans. Again, I am an emotional wreck right now. Thank you very much for this honor. That's it for today. Drop us a rating and review wherever you like to listen and give us a like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.